changes yeah like I was a little boy you know at home and uh, my grandmother used to dry the fish you know in the smokehouse then when the fish got dried it was just hard as a board real hard there that's the way they just dried their fish then she'd tell me in the evening you know take this dry salmon down to the river and throw it in the river tie a bale of hay wire onto the fish then tie it onto a limb and leave it in the water all night. So the next morning, he sent me down again after the dry salmon. And I go down and bring the dry salmon back into the... We lived in a smokehouse. It's a long house, but they call them smokehouse. <clears throat> and I'd bring the fish back up. And she'd cut them up and throw them in the pot and boil them up. Boiled potatoes, yeah. That's what we'd have for breakfast, dried fish. And that fish was just so nice and tender after it had been soaked in the, in the river all night. It was just nice and tender, you know. You could eat it without teeth. Real good fish, good eating. This is Bill Frank. He's 91 years old. He remembers how it used to be. And we mostly lived on dried fish and uh, fresh fish and all different kinds of fish, you know, that they come up the river. This river, Nesquale River, we lived up there about five miles from here, <clears throat> the mouth of Muck Creek. There must have been a village there. There were three of these long houses there, three smoke houses. When I come to, you know, and I re come into real life things. This is the Nisqually Indian Reservation, created under the provisions of the Medicine Creek Treaty of 1854. Like most reservation land, it was later allotted to individual Indian families. When Bill Frank was born in 1879, his family lived on their allotment of 205 acres. Now, Dad, when you was um, when you was living back over here on your um, on your property across the river, was there a lot more fish, Dad, at that time than there is today? Oh yes, yeah, the river was just full of fish. The, all these creeks were full of fish, Yellow Creek, Muck Creek. Yeah, I've several other creeks on up to the toward the La Grand. During World War I, the Army condemned the reservation land on the east side of the river for Fort Lewis. All the families on that side of the river were removed from their homes, and the government decided what compensation they were going to receive. Bill Franks received six acres several miles downstream from the reservation, and it is still held for him in federal trust like allotted reservation land. This is the place still known today as Frank's Landing. Bill Frank lives here. His wife, Angeline, lives with him. Your wish. Blow the <laughs> his son, Bill Jr., lives here too with his wife, Norma, their two children, Sugar and Maureen. Bill Frank Jr. and his family live in this house. And in this house lives Maysell, Grandpa's daughter, with her husband, Al Bridges. Elle and Maysell have three daughters, the youngest, Allison, and Valerie. Their oldest daughter, Suzette, lives here with her husband, Sid Mills, and the baby, Powton. And then there's Herman Johns, better known as Curly, another of Bill Frank's grandchildren. This is the family that lives at Frank's Landing. During the summer, they work at various jobs, frequently in neighboring berry fields and tree farms. But when autumn comes and the salmon start running, Bill Frank's family, like all their ancestors, set their nets for fish. They smoke some for themselves and they sell some even as their ancestors did when they traded dried salmon for articles from the interior. The 
one thing is different than it used to be. Now when they set their nets in the evening, the game wardens sit and watch from the other side of the river. were arrested off the landing here. So the following day, to let them know that we weren't going to quit fishing, Ellis and I, my younger sister, set a net up there at the trestle, about a mile, mile and a half from here, upriver. In 1854, territorial governor Isaac Stevens made treaties with all the Indians in Washington. The Indians gave up all claims to the land in the territory except for special areas reserved to them. In return, they were to receive payments and were promised that they and their descendants would always have the right to fish in their usual and accustomed grounds. Valerie Bridges grew up learning how to fish here on the Nisqually, where her grandfather fished. Valerie, you heard when your grandfather told of a white man who came with promises of gold, saying, sell us the land that lies under the sun you live free as long as the rivers run as long as the rivers run we set the net and waited for the state we're just going to let them know that we're not going to quit fishing we have this fishing right it's a treaty supreme law of the land under their constitution and we're not going to give up our fishing rights. There are treaties throughout the United States being broken. That's really what it is, a treaty we're fighting for. Treaties throughout the United States. We resisted when they did try to take our net because it is our property. And not only protecting our property, but ourselves, because we too have been clubbed. Night raids, tear gas, and we're getting sick and tired of it. He promised to go. He promised us grain, he promised us houses safe from the rain. He said that his words could not be undone, but would last for as long as the rivers run, as long as the rivers run. Uh. A lot of people have uh, asked, you know, how long uh, I've been involved in this or my family. And uh, I go back to when uh, my little girl was two and a half years old, my youngest girl. And uh, she'll be 19 next month. When she was two and a half uh, years old was the very first time that her dad was arrested and did 30 days in jail. This was her first experience in um, going into a, a judge's uh, courtroom, if you can call it, J.P. courtroom. May saw Bridges, Bill Frank's daughter, Valerie and Allison and Suzette's and mother. And they did this in the space of two, three hours. Like, they took him in, they sentenced him and put him right into jail. So my, my girls, all three of them, have been in involved in this fishing struggle practically all their lives. Leshi said no, he was caught, he was hung. The treaty was made, nothing else could be done. We said we'll keep our promises if you keep just one. Let us fish for as long as the rivers run, as long as the rivers the U.S. Supreme Court confirms that the treaty is still valid, but they say the state also has the right to impose conservation regulations. The Washington Fisheries and Game Department say 
that to conserve the fish, the mouth of the rivers must remain close to net fishing. But the river mouths always were the fishing grounds of the Indians. And once again, Al Bridges has to hawk a motor to bail a daughter out of jail. Valerie, you knew all this history well, but you saw your father being taken to jail, and you vowed you would fight for your people to lead one. Ours for as long as the rivers run, as long as the rivers run. Well, I think they're using the state is using the term uh, conservation as a weapon against the Indian to stop us all together from uh, fishing. You know, when you speak of uh, conservation, uh, uh, if they would, uh, if they're, if they're going to uh, conserve. They should start conserving out in the outer waters, uh, particularly in the in the Puget Sound. After the fish leave uh, the Straits of Juan de Fuca, you can go out here in the Puget Sound uh, when uh, they're fishing out there and find numerous uh, commercial boats and their take. One person boat out there in the, in the Sound can take. Probably, um, if uh, more fish in one day than uh, our whole group here can take in one season. There's uh, uh, various ways that uh, that the Indian has always uh, practiced conservation. Uh, this was done almost automatically. Uh, not only did they uh, allow uh, an escapement, but uh, elements of uh, of nature. Uh, provide for uh, escapement uh, or used to. But from uh, when uh, the treaty was first uh, signed in 1854, uh, when we ceded the land didn't uh, mean that we gave up our hunting and fishing rights. Uh, we think that we should be able to fish this way and uh, fish and hunt this way and live this way, uh, live uh, off the resources, the natural resources. This is probably what you'd call a, 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 the Indian's last stand. Uh, otherwise, you're just gonna, there'll no longer be a, what's uh, known as an Indian or an Indian way of life. I know some uh, boys around here, in fact, that if they were to uh, be taken to a, to a city, they'd wanna come back to this uh, kind of living. Uh, one in particular, uh, already has a trade as a welder, but he said, if I have to live in the city in order to make a living of that sort, then uh, I'll go back out in the country and hoe, uh, hoe berries or do something. I, it just is so I can get back to, the, to uh, my way of li uh, uh, my way that I want to live. And this is the Indian way. And we used to uh, think that we'd, uh, we'd find justice in the courts. This was before we, uh, we'd, we'd be arrested and we'd be taken to jail and we'd, uh, we'd serve our time. Then we'd come back out and then we'd hide around and fish. We found out that we weren't getting justice in the court. So uh, in order to find uh, some sort of a solution for this, uh, we, uh, we figured that if we got uh, the public interested enough to where they, they'd see what's going on in the courts that we would uh, get some sort of uh, uh, justice. And then in 1964, we just said, well, we're not moving no more. And one of the first things we did was to organize a Indian organization. And this is what we did. We called ourselves the Survival American Indian Association. 
And uh, our main goal and purpose of this organization was to fight for treaty rights. And uh, from that time on, the fight has been building up and gradually, it, it's really, you know, taking up our full time. <laughs> In 1968, the survival organization enlisted the support of sympathetic young people to help keep a 24-hour guard on the nets of the Indian fishermen, because if the nets and boats were unguarded, they would be stolen by fishermen or destroyed by sportmen. If you want something and, and if it's yours, you've got to fight to keep it. And our people just aren't grasping this idea. They think that one of these days, the government's going to feel sorry for them and give them what they want. This isn't so. So we have um, these young kids uh, of today. They, right now, they see what's happening to the Indians. So they come forward to offer their help, and we've accepted their help. Fishermen and sheriff deputies came at night, making arrest and seizing nets, but the young people held on. As fall turned into winter, they built temporary shelters and lived in them. Buffy St. Marie visit the encampment. the fishing rights, the Frank Landing encampment moved into Olympia and set a net at the mouth of the dam where there is a fish ladder. The fishery officers and police responded, giving the public a chance to see the kind of action that usually takes place under the cover of night on the Nisqually River. Come gather round me and I'll sing you a song. I'll tell you a story of people that were strong. We live with nature in harmony. Obeying the laws that were taught to me. Greeting each stranger with an open hand. Sheltered and fed him and called him friend. Once I was wild as the eagle in the sky Free to love and to live and to die I roam this land from the mountains to the sea Brother to the elk, the bear and the deer up the rivers, the lakes, and the redwood trees. This was my land as far as I could see. I had no jails nor prison farm, no barbed wire to do me harm. I paid no one to rule over me. No one owned the shade of the tree. I swam the... Now we have another beautiful young red sister, Suzette Bridges. Yeah! yeah. You know, um, when we go out, and talk to all these citizens of America, we tell them, you better do something about your government, because your government is awfully sick. 
and it's trying to make my people sick. And I keep trying to explain to these people we're never, never, never going to be like them. And I don't know who's wrong with that in heaven, but I don't know what's wrong with Dr. Carlson. Why is it that they keep practicing genocide on my people? And I keep telling him that he can get his and get. Of the people who came to help in 68, only one stayed. Sid Mills, a Yakima Indian station at Fort Lewis, announced he would not go back to the Army. Instead, he remained at Frank's Landing and married Suzette. A year later, dozens of cases were still in court. The survival of American Indian Association was broke. So once again, the family at Frank's Landing was alone on the Nisqually River. The day came that Al, Sid, Valerie, and Allison were all in jail. Suzette had just had a baby, Houghton. So Maysell Bridges and Norma Frank were left to fish by themselves. And then something happened that was felt around the world. A group of Indians captured and held Alcatraz Island and claimed it in the name of all tribes. Indians from all over came together to experience unity and strength. The girls in Sid went down with Powton as soon as they learned about it. Al and Maysell and Curly came a little later with a carload of food and clothes sent by the Washington Indians. they got to the docks, they were greeted by an old friend, John Vigil, who had fished with them at Frank's Landing the winter before. He was one of the first to occupy Alcatraz and agreed to take them on a tour. Up there in the water this is the flag flying high. Artichokes, huh? Oh, artichokes? Yeah. Yeah. Like a poppy. Do I know nobody's going to be climbing up this hill? Pretty to try to overrun this island. Alcatraz, it had been one of the things that the Indians had known was uh, possible for them to do. Those that knew of the laws created by the federal government in the nature of the treaties, they knew they had exclusive reversionary title to the place. There was an approach by the older conservatives, but the youth became immediately dissatisfied. And uh, 14 of us hired a fishing boat found a, a fishing boat captain who wasn't uh, afraid to take us to the island. We all paid him $3 each, and he, he took us on across, man. And we went there, not really knowing fully what to expect, but we knew that we were within our rights. Well, they 
they had a Thanksgiving dinner here, you know, except they invited everyone except Puritans. Oh. There's two ducks here and a turkey on my bicycle. had been the full demise of the Indians. This became fixed in our minds as long as we were there as representatives of our people, that we couldn't compromise their rights in any way. And this gave our total commitment to remaining on the island at any cost. Alcatraz was only 16 of the 30 million surplus federal acres. When the Indians actually take possession, their land holdings still won't be as extensive as they were in the original treaties. So because originally outlined in the treaties were 155 million acres approximately. And uh, their land holdings now are only uh, 50 million. The 30 million surplus acres are theirs, you know, because various forts and things that were established on the reservations and wartime military use uh, diminished those lands. And there's been a lot of illegal sale of Indian lands. That's why Alcatraz, that's the Alcatraz idea. We're going to no longer compromise. After Alcatraz, suddenly everyone was interested in Indians and their problems. But the Indians remembered the many years of slow, determined struggle by Indian groups all over the country to protect Indian rights and to build Indian unity. They knew that the Alcatraz idea was meaningless unless this unity and strength could be felt wherever Indian families were stubbornly holding on to what was left of their land and their way of life. The scene is repeated again and again. There is no longer room for compromise. It's a question of survival as Indians, and it's a question of survival as human beings because the Indian sees the white man tampering with the forces of nature, moving mountains, rivers, destroying source of food and water. This is the Muckleshoot Indian Reservation on the White River. Last night they put nets in the river, and this morning they tried again, but there were no fish, and the Indian know why. That and the fish got less. What's no more then? There used to be a lot of fish here long ago. Well, you know, this uh, regular, the mountain fish, they, they go way up, see? They, they don't spawn down. here. They go way up on them little streams, way up on the mountains. See, and they built that dam. And then the fish got less of them, and there was no more. Mm -hmm. Also, Mud Mountain Dam, when they, when they let out water, they let out a great deal of uh, what they call silt. We lost 35 to 400,000 fish when they were coming up to spawn because they know the fish can't breathe in silt. So they you know, de totally destroyed that run. Well, matter of fact, we asked the federal government to plant fish for us, and they planted them, but we, uh, we lost them because of uh, inadequate uh, system up on the, that diversion by Puget Power. We lost over 3,000 uh, fingerlings there. It's the inter-county uh, flood control system. We they push all this gravel back and forth and scrape all the hard pan yeah. off. And then when the river comes up, there's nothing but sand and gravel flowing and it kills the fish right there. And the land that borders the river line is slowly being beaten out of us by the white man because they are buying it out. Some of it we don't know if it's bought out, leased, or where the heirs are, how much money came from it. But that's our main interest here is to find out for sure if it really was leased, if it was sold, or just what's happening. Uh, this here is a diversion made by a landowner who has bought an Indian land. And when you, before you divert any river, you have to have a permit from the state. We asked the state prosecutor to bring necessary legal action to uh, put the stream back in its original or form since where he diverted this river, there's a spawning stream, and this has been totally destroyed. Right here we have a dying river. It's a river that's slowly dying because of 
uh, numerous factors, you find that we have several polluters, industrial polluters, trying to hide what they're putting in the river. The tribe at this time has gotten an attorney, and we're beginning to institute legal actions to protect the river, our resource. Do you think that the Indians lived better long time ago before they become modernized and in the degree they are today? Oh yeah, the less quality Indian. He lived in paradise, this, this quality Indian said. Everything grew here. Like uh, the white man calls it roots now, roots. Well, I guess there were more roots because they grew out of the ground. There were carrots, potatoes, onion, plants like an onion. It had layers all around it. And a whole lot of other plants, you know, the Indians used to gather up and uh, bake. They take it down the river where there's a big jam and a lot of wood. Then they bake all this stuff all together. And they had one little, little plant that looked like a carrot, but it was very little. It was short black, it was black. And it was sweet, very sweet. And they sweetened all these other roots, you know, that they, they baked. That one, one carrot would sweeten all the other fruit, like cabbage. And the sunflower, root of the sunflower, they, they cooked that. That made nice eating and everything. And game, grouse. Pheasant, all kinds of birds, you know, on the, on the trees, you could hear them. They just ring in the woods, the grouse, they're called grouse. They ring the woods, there were so many of them around on the trees that, and the Indian had plenty of bird to eat and plenty of game, like uh, deer, you know, and beaver and bear and all that. There was plenty of everything, yeah. I think the, in, the Nisqually Indian here yeah, was living the perfect life and he was living, he didn't have to cultivate this stuff. They grow them, Mother Nature made them grow every year. No getting the, what you call the, the mixed things grow like the white man got to the fertilizer. Nobody fertilized all that stuff. It just come up itself every year. Why these Indians were living in paradise, that's what I always said, before white men came. Then the white men come with a lot of sheep, unload them right here at Sigualichu down here, just around the bend here. The sheep loads the sheep to unload off the ship and run them. This was all open country. The whole country from Chehalis down here up to the Caleb Valley. On top of the hill, that was all open. What about the, what about, what happened when they uh, brought the sheep in? Well, the sheep just uh, went out and grazed and ate all the grass there was, you know, see. Destroyed the root that yeah. you used to yeah. gather? Yeah, the old Indian said they, they left nothing the sheep did. The no wild. more wild carrots, onions, or no potatoes? No more, yeah, that, uh, no more the Indian never. He had to live like the white man now, buy flour, buy coffee and like that, you know. Learn to bake bread and all like that. The Indian people, the, well, the young Indians today are, are caught between two cultures. The, the white man is pulling the Indian people into their culture, but the Indians have always been brought up to be Indians, you know, they've lived the Indian way all their lives, and they're caught between these two, and uh, they're, I feel that they're, um, the Indians are really mixed up, you know, because the only way they can make it in this society is to be a white man, but they can't, you know, the young Indians today are realizing that this society is sick, and that they don't want to have any part of it. I mean, you know, like they know that, uh, like during Geronimo's days and during Crazy Horse's days, 
that uh, the white man killed our people. And they're doing the same thing here today. They're killing our people because the way this system is set up, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And uh, in the old days, the Indians weren't that way. When their uh, brothers or sisters were uh, couldn't make it, then, then they were there right there to help them. And I, and I think, you know, like the Bureau of Indian Affairs, you know, they, uh, they're set up to, uh, to help the Indians to uh, make settlements for the Indian people, but they're selling, uh, selling the Indian people down the drain. They, the schools that they set up are, uh, are below the standard, the regular standard of education of a pub public school. And they, they make the Indians ashamed of what they are. But the Indians have something that the, that the white man will never have. They have a culture that they could be proud of, that they should be proud of. Allison Bridges was one of the organizers of a weekly dance in Tacoma. People believe the Indians were a vanishing race, but the Indians are not dying out. More and more young Indians are trying to learn about their culture and traditions. That doesn't mean just dancing and handicraft. It means returning to a way of life in harmony with the land and each other. It means helping Indian brothers and sisters who have fallen in despair in the cities. Well, why don't you tell us? Yeah. Well, like why don't you just say in your own words what uh, what you have in mind here? Senator, so we'd like to be able to read it to you. Uh, well. I, how long is it going to take? It won't take too long, Senator. Dear Senator Jackson, Canadian Topi Indian Council is submitting a proposal to obtain the United States Army land and buildings at Fort Lawton for use as a multi-service center and a cultural, vocational, and higher education center for all American Indian and Alaska Natives. Statistics recently published by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare indicate that there are over 3,000 Indian families in Greater Seattle, amounting to approximately 12,000 persons. The vast majority are at or below a poverty level of $1,200 per year. The educational level is a seventh grade average. Basically, we propose to use the 16 immediately available buildings and the surrounding area to contain our existing services and provide adequate space to help Indians and Alaska Natives solve these problems. We would point out that several of these programs are already funded and in operation, but are seriously limited due to inadequate physical facilities. We believe the time has now arrived for the Indian to use his own initiatives, take charge of his own destiny, and at the same time, help him make a contribution to greater society. Now, uh, the law provides that uh, after the military services have given their requirements, then it, the proposal is circulated among all federal agencies as to their needs. And they have, uh, I think, 60, what is it, how many days is it? Normally 30 days. 30 days in which to make the request. So you will have to go through the Department of Interior as to pure Indian matters, HUD on the housing and OEO and OEO so on. And so forth. So you, I can only emphasize very strongly the need to, you know, follow the law on that because uh, otherwise you wouldn't be eligible. We're going to do right well, now. We, we're it, going to look around and try to, us over. And we'll have a better uh, picture of it than we'll carefully consider all of this. He wasn't even paying attention. 
Well, that's how they all are. Said, well, I'm too busy. I got things to do. I got to do this, you know. And you should have an alternative. Tell the cat that we got to know in a week because Indian children are dying today. There's people starting to lean up against the fence tonight sleeping. Maybe some of these ideas that you say should have been expounded. I'm sorry I didn't no, think about it. No. What I'm saying is, and if it takes to occupy the place to show the man that we really need it now, then we're going to have to do it. Tomorrow, we shall leave the sand to reclaim part of the land that has been taken away from us, that has been paid for. A war dance was held. The plan to occupy the surplus land at Fort Lawton was announced. The next morning, Indians stormed the fort from every direction. Some climbed fences, some came up the cliffs from the beach, some rushed through the gates. The army closed in on scattered groups of Indians. Women were knocked to the ground. Men were clubbed. Cameras were smashed. Movie film and tapes were destroyed. Sixty-four people, the youngest of them three years old, were held all day in two cells. After most of them had been released, a dozen military men fell on those remaining and beat them in their cells. The Indians tried to tell their story, but the army denied everything. Next week, the Indians came again, this time in one group, silently climbing the cliffs in the dark of night, waiting just under the edge of the bluff until the first light of morning. Where's he at? Try the council here, all council people over here. <laughs> now try to head anything off. I think we ought to send a couple, three people down here under a flag of truth. Let them know that this is a peaceful, non-violent settlement. And we don't want to interfere with the military okay. operation. Uh, let's have a flag of truth. Who's got a handkerchief? I do. Put it on the No, we must have it. Yeah. Oh. <coughs> Don't worry. You don't be on the road, please. He said that, man, we can't stay here. We were informed that they had 35,000 troops at his disposal, and he will call them if necessary. <laughs> A few, including the movie cameraman, fled back down the cliff, pursued by MPs. The others waited, allowing themselves to be taken away without resisting. Federal trespassing charges were filed against them. The Indians were defeated once again by the U.S. Army. Young Sugar Frank spent his first day in jail, and his family knew that there would be more times, many more times for all of them, and that they would go on fighting because they saw more and more Indian people coming together in victory and defeat being united. And then, the cruelest blow of all for this family which had suffered so much before. One day, Valerie Bridges came home, hot and tired from working in the strawberry fields. She went to bathe and swim in the Nisqually River. Much later, her family missed her and began to search. It may have been a sudden cramp. No one is sure, but they found her body at the bottom of the river. There's no goodbye. There is. May our 
trails cross many times as we travel toward the setting sun of life and when we meet may they flow through my hand as I gently touch your arm happiness in seeing you again soon people began to arrive Indians from Canada Oregon Idaho Indians from Alcatraz many relatives and many people who knew her in the struggle for Indian rights Indians came together from all over the West because they had always come together at times of need and sorrow we returned Valerie's body to the earth, and then we shared a feast in her honor to remind ourselves that we would be together again. And in their suffering, the family at Frank's Landing was reminded that the Indian people still had a strength and unity unlike anything the white man had. They vowed to continue in the struggle to which Valerie had given all of her short life. Valerie, you heard when your grandfather told Of a white man who came with promises of gold Saying, sell us the land that lies under the sun You'll live free as long as the rivers run As long as the rivers run Indian people everywhere are beginning to look back for the strength and wisdom that was theirs long before the white man came with his promises. From many tribes and nations, people are traveling around the country sharing knowledge of their Indian teachings and news of their struggle for Indian rights. Some of the people who came to Frank's Landing stayed to help. Everybody decided to join in a united stand on the Puyallup River. Puyallup Tribal Council had discovered a tiny piece of land in Tacoma between the railroad tracks and the sewage treatment plant that had never been sold and was still Puyallup Reservation. Here they set up a camp and announced that they were going to fish and protect their nets with armed guards. The Indian people are beginning to realize that there's nobody going to stand up and fight for them, that we've got to do it ourselves, and we're realizing this. They're starting to realize, you know, that they shouldn't go in the Army and, and you know, everything else. Sid and Suzette Mills went to live in the Puyallup camp. It's going to take, you know, for Indian people to get away from the United States. To be a sovereign nation like they're supposed to be, it's going to take but everyone to get together as one. The camp was set up, you know, because the pigs came down there and beat up Indian people, you know, for fishing and just for being there. And uh, so we had to, you know, protect ourselves. So we got a, our own police force or, you know, security guard or whatever you want to call it, you know, to protect the kids and the women and, and even the men, you know, that are in the camp from being harassed by the pigs. And, you know, we just, they're protecting our equipment like, you know, we stated we was going to do. And, you know, they came down with about three, five hundred pigs and started riding. He promised us gold, he promised us grain, he promised us houses safe from the rain. He said that his words could not be undone, but would last for as long as the rivers run, as long. Oh, 
owns the mountains, no one owns the sky, no one owns the graves where our fathers lie, no one owns our mother, who is the earth, who is the sea, we want to live by the river and fish and be free. I said no, he was caught, he was hung, the treaty was made, nothing else could be done, we said we'll keep our promises if you keep just one, let us fish for as long as the rivers run, as long. Where now are your promises? You have stolen our home. You display in museums our ancestors' bones. We're not afraid of your guns or the words that you say. We just want to fish by the river and live our own way. They are stronger than us with their courts and their jails, but the strength of the earth and the sky never fails. We've the power of the river, the light of the sun, and we'll live for as long as the rivers run. From the oceans of ice to the deserts of sand, our people are gathering to rescue the land. Valerie, we promise the fight's just begun and will last for as long as the rivers run, as long as the rivers run. Years of struggle, beatings, jails, thousands of dollars to Bale's bondsmen, and at the end of 1970, what was there to show for it? Actually, the Indians had made a couple of steps forward. They were winning a few cases in court. The state was finding it harder and harder to defend its policy of complete prohibition of net fishing on rivers. So the fishery department opened temporary Indian fishing season, Puyallup, Nisqually, Muckleshoot, and Skokomish began to haul in record catches of silver salmon. But the fish buyers dropped their prices to as low as 10 cents a pound. Once again, the Indians found it necessary to get together. At Frank's Landing, they began buying fish from Indian fishermen at 40 cents a pound. Young Indians, some of whom had first got together on Alcatraz and had just been released on bond from the Tacoma jail, were now putting in long hours of cleaning and packing fish. Several tons were shipped to New York, Florida, San Francisco, where they could bring up to a dollar a pound. The Indian people here will, con you know, they'll be continuing on in the struggle until they do have their, you know, undisputed right you know, to fish for a livelihood. We have the Puyallup encampment on the Puyallup Indian Reservation, and we have the state of Washington coming in and dragging Indian people off Indian land and throwing them in jail for uh, three or four days with with these ridiculous high, ridiculously high bales. And, you know, the Indian people get this in their head. And, you know, like it's in my head that there's nobody gonna stand up and fight for us. There's nobody we can look to but ourselves. And, and like, like, like we set up this, this uh, fish, fish processing project. Uh, we buy fish from nearby Indians right here on Frank's Landing. 
And this is to eliminate the middleman, to eliminate that other way of killing us by dropping the fish price when the fish are coming in the hardest, you know. And like we, we're bought, trying to buy them on a level where the Indian people can support themselves. Just like, you know, very soon there's the steelhead are going to be running in this river. And we're still going to be here fishing as we've always been, you know, like we've been in the past centuries. Uh, there's like, I have a, a son that's going to keep on fishing even after I'm gone because he's a fisherman. It's his heritage. You know, we're just going to keep on fighting for as, as long as it takes. Once I was wild as the eagle in the sky, free to love and to live and to die. I roam this land from the mountains to the sea. Brother to the elk, the bear and the deer. Up the rivers, the lakes and the redwood tree. This was my land as far as I could see. I had no jails, nor prison farm, no barbed wire to do me harm. I paid no one to rule over me, no one owned the shade of the tree. I swam the ocean with a mighty shark. Played with the dolphin when the moon was dark. Come be as wild as the eagle in the sky. Free to love and to live and to die. We'll roam this land from the mountains to the sea. Brother to the elk, the bear and the deer. Up the rivers, the lakes, and the redwood tree, we'll live together in harmony. Ah, 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 Oh, <laughs> 